This is really about being free to create what you want your life to look like. We each are our own hero. And how do we take the challenges that come our way and see those as the birth process of us becoming heroic? Can you meet that judgment that ultimately will surface with neutrality? This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for watching the Wall Street Coach podcast. This is a request for you to sign up if you're interested in more information about how you can check in on yourself before your trading day. Please go to tradercheckin.com and download a very short assessment that you can take before you start trading every day. I hope you enjoy this interview with Joe Fami, and I'm looking forward to you subscribing and maybe giving us some comments if you're open to it. Have a great day. Aloha, everybody. Welcome back to the Wall Street Coach Podcast. Today, I'm very excited and honored to have Joe Fami here. Joe and I got to meet at Traders for a Cause just a few months ago. We had a great conversation. We got to spend some time together and get to know each other a little bit. So I've been wanting him, him to be on my podcast for Well, way before that, but that just made it easier to ask you. So hi, Joe. Welcome to my podcast. Thank thank you. Great to see you, Kim. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to see you too. We're going to do a two-part today, guys. We're going to do this conversation, then we're going to go over to Twitter space. But I just want to give you a little background and bio on Joe. He is an investment advisory representative at Zor Capital LLC, a New York-based investment management firm. He has over 21 years of trading experience during which he developed his own investment strategy. His extensive knowledge of technical analysis, market forecasting, and risk management has landed him appearances all over television, Wall Street Week, CNBC, Fox Business, ABC News, CNN Money, and he's a regular a contributor to Yahoo Finance. He completed his undergraduate work at Tufts University, receiving a BA in economics and religion in 95. And outside of trading, Joe enjoys playing the drums, travel, and sports, which lends me to my first question. Is being a musician, specifically a drummer, serve you in the markets? That's a great question. Maybe uh, the patterns or something uh, with chart patterns and, and drumming and so forth. I'm just a big fan of music, and the first thing I thought of is it's important for traders to listen to music during the day. can help calm you down, help you put in a good mindset, but nothing besides maybe the drum patterns that might be uh, subconsciously of interest with chart patterns. Yeah, I'm curious, When what do you play during the day if you find yourself getting very frustrated? Is there a go-to music that you know will just like kind of soothe you uh metallica always works uh (laughs) awesome it depends i'm a big fan of screening stocks during the day kind of getting a feel for the market especially in the middle of the trading day when it's slow it's all over the place sometimes it's classical sometimes it's jazz sometimes it's some some uh, you know hardcore you know whatever i listen to everything rock rap everything so uh Mm -hmm. it depends on the mood that i'm in but i think there's a study that says if you listen to music that you like within seven or eight minutes it instantly improves your mood so i think it's a big thing especially during the quiet periods of the day to have have some music playing on in the background to keep you uh in a decent mood yeah it uh, i definitely there are a lot of studies about the impact of music and i've always been fascinated about musicians in general and how there are certain kind of tips and tricks that music does for those people. But I think it does it for all of us, but musicians perhaps are paying close attention to it. So that's very cool. That's very cool. One of the things that I've just, you know, seen you out there talking, you've said kind of two things at once. You spoke to a 5 to 10% decline in 2023 at the start, but you also have urged people to stay open-minded and to protect the confidence so that when there is a shift, they'll be confident, ready to go. Just talk about like both of those, this correction that you feel is afoot, and also how do you stay confident in the midst of that? Yeah, the first part is, I've been doing this roughly 25 years, I'd say up until really five or six years ago, the importance of that phrase, don't fight the Fed, was really resonated with me. It comes from Marty Zweig, who used to say, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the tape. And I always heard, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the Fed. I didn't really realize the significance of that since 
you know, over the past few years, how they affect interest rates. So for example, after COVID, once in a century pandemic, they did all these accommodative measures to make sure that the world and the economy wasn't going to come to an end through their bond buying and increasing their balance sheet and keeping rates near zero. But then about a year ago, late December, early January, that's when I went out on my blog, did some TV appearances saying that now all of that changed. So they're taking away that accommodation. So I think the main word after the pandemic was accommodative, you know, uh, environment for stocks. And then it switched to restrictive by stopping their bond buying, by reducing their balance sheet. And as we know, in the past 12 months, raising interest rates considerably. So whether, you know, going back to the question, whether we see a decline, it's just sort of an instinct I have to start the year. Whether we see it or not, I don't really care. I don't have an ego when it comes to the markets about calls. I think it's very important to stay flexible, to stay open-minded. In other words, in the back of my mind, I think we could see a little bit more downside, a little bit more volatility to the downside. But I'm flexible and open-minded that if conditions improve, I'm able to change my mind. That also comes from Stanley Druckenmiller, who says one of his greatest assets in the past 30 years is his ability to change his mind. A lot of the great traders, hedge fund managers, investors throughout time have consistently said, be flexible, be willing to change your mind. So I still think we could be in that restrictive environment for a bit, but I'm willing to be flexible if conditions change and if market conditions improve to change my tune along with what I see in the markets. You know, you spoke just now to this concept of being able to change your mind. One of the words I use for that is practicing neutrality. What do you think it takes for a trader to truly be able to live in a place of neutrality? Again, first thing that comes to my mind is getting your face punched in, <laughs> getting beat up. You quickly should learn that the market doesn't care about you. It doesn't care if you have to pay your bills, put food on the table, put kids through college, whatever. I mean this like it'll chew you up and spit you out. So from years of doing this, when you read the Market Wizards books, you see a very common theme with some of the best traders and investors is they struggled earlier in their career and lost money and got their face punched in. Same with me. And I think that humbles you. And it really gets you to realize to separate your ego from your trading, to separate your, you know, when you think you got things figured out, the market has a convenient way of humbling you. So that sort of experience and going through those waves and those ups and downs really, I think, helps you to stay neutral and to stay flexible and realize the market's going to be around way longer than we are. And it's, 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 it'll chew you up and spit you out. So you have to have a flexible and humble approach when it comes to the markets. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you've said that cracked me up was you said, I probably could never write a book because the book's title would be so offensive about stop. I'll, I'll say the nice, nice version. Stop being a baby <laughs> and make a decision. Talk a little bit more about the importance of being able to make decisions. I like I like your your B word better than my B word. <laughs> <laughs> I think yours is funnier, but I already have explicit on my podcast because I curse so much. So I'm trying to dial it back. Joke. <laughs> so yeah, what was the question? I'm sorry, I was I was just laughing at my own quote. <laughs> uh, you scold all traders at saying oh. that they have difficulty making decisions. Oh yes, and they, yeah, and that they don't want it. You want them to stop being babies, and they have to kind of you know. That's not just trading advice. That's life advice. I think you build your strength through making decisions. So. The problem is when it comes to the stock market, it, be, it involves a lot more emotion because your money's on the line, especially in my case, if I'm trading for you know managing money for other people. But even if you're just trading your own money, there's a lot of emotions involved. What if I lose? What if, what if, what if? And again, the first half of my career, I dealt with shoulda, coulda, woulda. I dealt with so much indecision, you know. What if I sell this and it goes higher? What if I stop myself out and it turns around? What if, what if, what if, what if? And you just literally, when shoulda, coulda, woulda, you end up shooting all over yourself, so to speak. So you have to learn to, again, it's just from experience. One characteristic of uh, successful people is their desire to improve themselves. So if you keep repeating those mistakes over and over, I would hope for some people a light bulb goes off where you just want to improve. You want to make these decisions and say, okay, 
I was struggling before because of indecision. So one way to simply improve is to be able to make decisions. And I think in my quote, I talk about before you can lift 25 pounds, you have to be able to lift five pounds. Before you can make a decision with 100 shares, you have to be able to do it with 10 shares. So yes. one way to help with that is start small because it's a muscle that you're training to be able to make decisions. Because if I can honestly say one thing that I think when people say, oh, you have all this experience and you're a guru, and I'm not any of that. I just think the main thing is I'm able to make decisions. And that's what separates me. You know, I'm not, I'm trying to be humble saying this from, yeah. you know, newer traders or people who struggle with this is I'm okay making a decision. I'm okay with the result, period, end of sentence. Yeah. Do you feel, because, you know, of course, I'm always fascinated with the mindset and the emotional intelligence of traders. Do you feel that that inevitably is going to take traders time like you've been in the game a long time do you think it's just a matter of them hitting their head against that brick wall so many times they finally say wow i've got to really shift how i'm approaching this or do you feel it's an internal like confidence me I mean, on one hand especially those who are not veterans they they do need to question themselves right but there is that level of you have to step into that place of confidence. So what's the way somebody can measure whether they are becoming too confident or is it appropriate now for them to just make a decision, come what may? Where do they draw that line? In your trading, we've had those ups and downs I've talked about. When you start to feel you know it all and you start thinking, oh, maybe I should make an expensive purchase or pay off this or whatever, that's probably you have to follow I call it like your own internal sentiment indicator where you don't want the highs to get too high and the lows to get too low. So when you start feeling you know too much, like I said, the market conveniently has a way of humbling you. So when you start pounding your chest like King Kong and you think you're the greatest trader ever, we might have that if we have a good run of trades. Yeah. You just have to have that internal sentiment measure to tone that down a little bit and vice versa. When you're going through struggling times, you asked earlier about what keeps me positive is I've also accepted from studying history that the market has its cycles. You have over the last hundred years, several bear markets, several bull markets, whatever the stats are. So what keeps me positive is knowing that when you have those down times and you're feeling despair and you're struggling in the markets is that that's just sort of the winter time of the market and that spring will eventually come around and we've had cycles of markets so that that new bull market or that new amazing uptrend will come around. So that reminding me of that just helps me from getting too high and too low to the, I think the word acceptance, accepting the cycles of the markets. Yeah. And just because I forgot to say at the beginning today, uh, January 10th, 2023, if anybody's keeping track, you do quote what you just spoke to. I'm, I'm going to pull from one of the blog posts you had where you quote, live more. And you said about there's nothing new on Wall Street or in stock speculation. What has happened in the past will happen again and again and again. So when do you feel you first learned that? Jesse Livermore has a lot of amazing quotes. And um, you can even just Google like Jesse Livermore quotes. And I have a few favorites, but that is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a couple of cycles to understand Nothing new changes in the market because human behavior is the same. Mm -hmm. Stocks come and go, but the fear and greed from humans existed 100 years ago, exist today, and will exist 100 years from now. Yeah. That same emotion, human beings don't change. They get fearful at the same time, greedy at the same time. And when it really struck me with that quote is during the dot-com era, 95, 2000s, around the time I started trading, and there were three, four hundreds, everything dot com was there three or four hundred dot com, something like that. And then after the collapse, when the dust settled, a handful of them, you know, eBay and, uh, you know, Google came around, Amazon, AOL, like and eventually got bought out. But a handful of them survived. When I studied history, I realized the same thing happened in the late 20s. The railroads was the crack invention of the time. The railroads was the dot com of the 20s because it was a new thing to get people from point A to point B. And if you look at it, there were two or 300 railroad companies that all went up like crazy. And then after the crash in 29, again, only a handful of them survived. So the analogy when you studied history or when I studied history made me realize the significance of that quote that companies come and go. 
but human emotions the same. So that's why I don't really marry stocks, so to speak, because I just know that a lot of them might be great companies, but the stock performance comes and goes. Yeah. You know, I we're going to talk about more of this on Twitter space, but while I know you don't personally hold a position in Bitcoin, many people are curious about crypto. So I'm just kind of curious what you think is going to happen in 2023 with crypto. I don't have a strong opinion on that. I mean, I understand the store of value and currency and how it can be a play on the Federal Reserve and the global central banks printing money. But I don't have a strong opinion. I think a lot of the altcoins will not survive, but I do see a use for Bitcoin. And I again, I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. Yeah, that's, that's an opinion. So thank you for it. We're going to hop over to Twitter space, but I just wanted to ask you if there's one thing that you, if you had a magic wand to wave over her traders and investors regarding kind of the mindset that they really need to have, not just for 2023, but just for their rest of trading, investing career, what it would be that mindset suggestion? Do everything in your power to keep your mind sharp and keep your mind strong. 80% of trading is psychology. I don't care if someone hands you the greatest setup or the greatest trading philosophy on a silver platter. If your mind's not right and your head's screwed up, you're going to screw it up. So you have to do every single thing in your power to keep your mind strong every single day. And that's for people who want to achieve superior performance. Some people just index. There's nothing wrong with that. They don't watch their investments and they're in it for 10, 20, 30 years. That's fine, too. But for traders who want to achieve superior performance, you got to focus on gratitude is very important because gratitude can help eliminate the two emotions that screw up our trading, which is fear and anger, working out and working on some sort of exercise. When I talked about characteristics of successful people. It's not just improving yourself. A lot of successful people focus on some form of spirituality. I don't tell people what to believe, but gratitude is important. And they also focus on their um, physical health. So gratitude, physical health, who you surround yourself with, and also reading the proper things can help feed your mind to keep your mind strong like a muscle. So those are some sort of tips to just stay focused on everything in your power to keep your mind sharp. Yeah, I'm fascinated that you just spoke to spirituality. In fact, when I read your bio the first time and saw that you had uh, that be a in religion, that's really what I wanted to open with because I'm fascinated by spirituality and all world religions. So before we close up and go to Twitter space, just tell me why you would say spirituality is worth investigating to make a trader or an investor be the best they could be? I just think it's important. I mean, I majored in religion and economics. I joke because I pray that I make money. So that's how I try to combine those majors. But <laughs> I, um, I think when you study all the world religions, they basically, for the most part, all have the same theme of just be a good human being and just be a decent person. Yeah. And I think it's important. Spirituality can help, as I said, to clear your mind to help when you focus on gratitude or whatever you believe in, as long as it's for a good cause, it can help relax your mind, which is important when you approach trading. So I think spirituality, again, it's such a sensitive topic because people are saying, oh, you tell me what to believe and what not to believe. I really don't care. I just think it's important to, again, do things in your power to help ease your mind, to help, you know, to help approach trading with a stronger mindset. And for me personally, I've found spirituality has helped tremendously, whether it's meditation, whether it's gratitude, whatever whatever works for you to help calm your mind down when you're approaching your trading. Yeah, it's beautiful, Joe. And I love the concept of or the emphasis on gratitude, because I do see that when you have a practice of gratitude, you will see a shift in, like you said, the fear and the greed. Those two will shift if you start to focus on what you do have as opposed to what you don't have. It's not yeah. a practice you hear often advocated in this world, but it's so powerful. I see the impact that it has for the people I work with and for my own journey. Yeah, that's that's one of the things when I read a while ago, it really struck a nerve with me that the human mind is not capable of being grateful and angry at the same time. 
You can't be grateful and fearful. So that whole anger and fear that screws up, not just our trading, can screw up our relationships, our businesses. And those are the two main emotions that can mess you up. So when you focus on gratitude, if your mind can't do this and this at the same time, by focusing on gratitude, it reduces that anger, reduces that fear, reduces all those bad emotions that can mess up our trading. So yeah. it's, at least to me, it's an important part of just not only trading, my life in general. It's awesome. All right, everybody, we're going to head over to Twitter space now, and we'll see you in just a minute. Aloha, everybody. Welcome to my Twitter space with Joe Fanny. I'm so excited to have you guys here. Joe, I just recorded a Zoom podcast, and that, along with this part two, will be released probably in about a week or so on my podcast, The Wall Street Coach. I'm an executive coach that does EQ, trading coaching. I help people with their emotional intelligence, myself and my team. Joe and I had the great fun pleasure of meeting and getting to laugh at the Traders for Confidence back. Gosh, when was that, Joe? I've lost track of time. It feels like I know. It does feel like a long time ago. <laughs> October, maybe? Joe, welcome. Yeah, no? Well, October, was it that? October, October November, November, something like that, Joe. yeah. I'm, I'm losing my mind since like age. And one of the things you cracked me up with, you, you have so many funny things to say on your blog post, but there was one thing you said about a dating site for people over 60 called Nap Na- Napchat. That's my billion dollar idea if anyone wants to steal <laughs> it. It's genius. It's genius plus tupperware spaghetti colored tupperware i'm, just, I'm, like, I'm trying to save people time and they, <laughs> they're welcome to steal my ideas for business ideas go ahead and run with it <laughs> you're a good man very generous soul giving these all away so everybody i want you to know a little bit about joe i did talk about it in the podcast video part but just to repeat joe is an investment advisory representative at Zor capital llc and you're Based investment management firm. Over 21 years of trading experience during which he's developed his investment strategy. He has extensive knowledge on technical analysis, market forecasting, risk management, and it's lensed him on everywhere and everything you could watch by way of video uh, of Wall Street Wisdom, Wall Street Week, CNBC, Fox Business, ABC News, CNN Money, and he's a regular contributor to Yahoo Finance. He completed his undergraduate work at Tufts University, receiving a BA in economics and religion in 95. Joe and I got to talk a little bit just now in the video podcast portion about the importance actually of even spirituality. That's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. And one of the pieces we talked about in spirituality is the importance of gratitude. So Joe, if you don't mind, I'm going to open with that just because I've seen how profound the concept of gratitude for those who are traders or investors is and the impact it has. Are you open to just speaking to that a little bit? And of course, if you guys have questions, we're going to take those too. Yeah, I think it's very important, as I said in the video portion of our podcast, I think it's very important to work on everything in your power to keep your mind sharp and strong, especially when you approach the markets and approach trading. It can be very volatile, very emotional, our money's involved and all sorts of things. So I think gratitude is one way to help ease your mind and to help stay focused on, you know, a strong mindset. Because as I said, fear and fear and anger are two of the biggest emotions that screw up our trading and, and, and can screw up relationships, businesses and our lives in general. So by focusing on gratitude can help minimize that fear, minimize that anger, because the human mind's incapable of being grateful and fearful at the same time. So I think it's important to focus on gratitude. A lot of people might say, well, what do I have to be grateful for? And I say, well, I don't even know you. And I can just list 50 things you could be grateful for. You know, the fact that you woke up this morning, the fact that you have a little food in your fridge, a roof over your house, friends, family that love you. And, you know, it, there's, there's a million things you can be grateful for. And I think when we focus on that a little bit more in our lives, it not only keeps our mind at ease, but also can translate to becoming a better trader because as a trader, it's important to approach it with reduce those emotions and approach trading by being calm, by being confident. And I think focusing on gratitude can help strengthen those emotions of being calm and confident in the markets. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a matter of mindset. How you do one thing is how you do everything. And if you are practicing gratitude in your day-to-day life, it can't help but extend over into how you trade. One of the things that you have spoken about 
is that you encourage people, especially in the midst of this market, you know, the way it's showing up to stay open minded, to protect even your confidence so that you're mentally ready to take advantage of the next group of winning growth stocks. How are you doing this personally, Joe? I think one of my favorite quotes is our sayings is success leaves clues. So find people who are successful at something you want to do and mimic them with your own flavor, your own personality, your own blueprint. For example, if you want to lose 20 pounds, find someone who was successful doing it and try to ask some questions and try to mimic them. And, and how it applies to the markets is I'm always looking to have superior performance and to perform consistently in the markets. So I've studied some of the best. I've studied Paul Tudor Jones and David Teppers and Stanley Druckenmillers and William O'Neill's and all these great traders and investors through time. And one thing they all have in common is they're able to keep their minds open. They're able to be flexible. They're able to adapt. As Paul Tudor Jones has a quote, you either adapt, die, evolve in the markets. And the key, I'm paraphrasing his quote, but the key word is adapt. You have to be able to adapt to the market conditions. You know, for example, after the pandemic was a very accommodative condition where you could do certain type of trades and buy maybe higher valuation names with a low interest rate environment. But you also have to adapt to over the past year, we've been in, had restrictive conditions where value has outperformed growth and valuation matters. So it's important to recognize the environment you're in and adapt to it. You know, David Tepper was aggressively short financials in the 0809 fa financial and, and housing crisis and literally turned on a dime and went aggressively long in March of 09. And now I don't know the exact story, but I can't think of anything more flexible and more open-minded than to be aggressively short a sector and then to flip 180 and go aggressively long and just be dead right. Because usually when you're short, you want everything to just, you know, go to zero and you start getting caught in that mindset. But when you study a lot of these great traders, their flexibility is really impressive. Just curious, what do you feel are the biggest misconceptions about trading and investing in general that you would like to change if you could? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question and a loaded question too. I think the first thing that comes to mind is the ease of trading because the ease of whatever the word is, like entry and the barrier to become a trader is very simple. People might equate that with trading is simple because you can literally go on your phone and open a brokerage account and fund it from your bank and be trading. Uh, you don't have to wait till the morning. You can trade after hours pre-market and literally be trading the next day or same day. But just because it's that easy to open an account and fund it, it doesn't mean trading is going to be easy. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions is it takes time. It takes time to become great at anything. Just because you can go out and golf and rent golf clubs doesn't mean you, you, know, you can go out today and, and golf doesn't mean you're going to do well. It takes time. So the barrier to entry is easy, but to be consistently profitable and it involves hard work. And that's not just some cliche, but it involves a lot of hard work and involves a lot of discipline and a lot of dedication, you know, as far as just because trading's easy doesn't mean you're going to do well at it. So you, you have to be honest with yourself, too. You have to do a lot of post analysis and be honest with yourself with your trading as well. How did you yourself over the years become more honest with yourself? Uh, a lot of drinking. No, I'm kidding. No, I think you just I think you, one common thing is you find out you get punched in the face a lot of times. And the characteristic of uh, successful people, we talked about this earlier, is your desire to improve yourself. I'm always looking to improve. The market can humble you big time. So when you make those mistakes, you know, the definition of insanity is just repeating them over and over and over. So I didn't want to keep repeating those mistakes so I had to make adjustments. And I think it comes from failure. I think it comes from you know struggling in the markets, to be honest with yourself. Going back to another question you asked, though, is what keeps me optimistic is that, you know, I, I always want to try to keep some sort of a positive note for people is that these are just the cycles of the markets. We're going to have bull markets and bear markets. But what keeps me optimistic is there's always newer entrepreneurial companies that are in their early growth stages that are just being held back right now by the markets. And a perfect example that I've talked about before is in 08, 09, so many stocks got hit 50 to 90% during the global financial crisis, but Netflix and Green Mountain Coffee, when we came out of 
that correction in March of 09, April of 09, were two of the first stocks to make new highs because Netflix only had five or 10 million subscribers on their way to becoming over 200 million subscribers. Green Mountain Coffee that makes the Keurig, they were in less than 1% of households on their way to becoming closer to 10% of households. So my point is, those stocks had incredible gains, thousands and thousands of percent, and that was coming out of a big bear market. So what keeps me optimistic is, I don't know right now what those companies are, but it, the, the patterns in the history repeats itself. Right now, there are tons of companies in their early growth stages that will go on to show tremendous gains. And that's what keeps me optimistic is the light at the end of the tunnel. When we come out of this correction, there'll be some great, great companies that are in their early growth stages that traders can do well on. You know, I hear all the time the phrase to protect your capital, but I think you've coined another one, protect your confidence. Because that is, if you aren't feeling confident, if you're really demoralized, I imagine your ability to see that horizon is going to be limited and shortened. And what it sounds like you're saying is based on that happening in the past, you have just now got the memo that it's always important to keep an eye out for that ship that is going to start to come in at some point. Yeah, because when things turn... I've had friends that have gotten beaten up so much in these corrective and bear market environments that when things turn and I get really excited, you can almost hear it in my voice, this stock is looking great, it's near new highs. The whole concept is if a stock survived a brutal bear market, it's not automatic, but it has a higher probability of success. You know, So when Netflix yeah. and Green Mountain Coffee were at new highs, in fact, it's, a, it's an interesting trivia question. Coming out of the global financial crisis, the first stock to make an all-time high was Green Mountain Coffee. They went private and so forth, but it went on for like a 2,000% gain. And the whole concept is if you survive that brutal bear market where the markets were down 50% or more in certain sectors in 08, 09, you probably have a high probability – of success. And the problem is that I know that's going to happen again. So I br I'd bring it up to some friends and say, look at this stock. It looks good. It has all the recipe and the blueprint of a big winner. They're so defeated and beaten up. You can hear it in their voices. They're like, ah, I don't want to buy that. And I've gotten yeah. so killed. I'm not interested. Or if they're going to buy 100 shares normally, they might buy 10 and say, all right, I'll take a little bit when, you know, their confidence, you can hear it in their voice or if you're talking to them, see it in their body language. They've just been beaten up. And it's just a reminder to keep that mind sharp and to protect your confidence for the next bull run or the next uptrend. Yeah. Just to remind you guys that we're going to take questions if you have any. I haven't seen anybody raise their hand yet, but it's a great opportunity to ask Joe really any question about his 21 years plus 25 at this point of his trading experience. And he's seen so many downturns that I think, well, at least you tell me how many downturns have you seen, Joe? I know. I, I should say I've had over 100 years experience trading because it feels <laughs> like that. Yeah, I remember trading railroad stocks in 1914 pretty well. No, I I've seen three big cycles. I would say the 95 to 99 dot com, you know, PC era. You know, I saw that cycle and then the big downturn from the dot com blow up. And then it prolonged into a three year bear market after 9 11. So it went on from, you know, an added recession from 2000 to 2003 is where we bottomed. Then I saw the big boom, 03 to 07. Housing stocks did really well. There was a big, you know, they kept it was, they kept interest rates pretty low and stable. And, and it was the lending practices were almost too lenient that led to the housing and global financial crisis. And then I would say more recently, you know, even just shorter term as far as the last few years, the Fed providing an incredibly accommodative environment after the pandemic and then, you know, basically turning it to a restrictive environment. So we've seen the big boom in growth stocks from 2000 to growth stocks really topped in February of 2021. Then the market topped later in the year, December 21, early, early 2022. But yeah, you, you kind of have to see a bunch of cycles sometimes. And it just reminds you, we're going to continue to see those cycles. I always joke, you can't guarantee anything in the markets, but I guarantee we're going to have another bull market. I just don't know when. And guess what? After that, I guarantee we're going to have another bear market. I just don't know when. But those are the cycles of the markets. And after you see them, you, you the word acceptance starts to come in. You start to accept that these are just the cycles of the markets. Yeah. One of the things that you have on your website, which is joefam.com, guys, if you want to go check it out, 
you have this amazing investor education world, and I'm just going to sing its praises for a minute in it for a really low price per quarter. Joe actually has seminars, weekend stock market videos, midweek updates, actionable trade ideas, monthly live screen webinars, plus eight hours of content. What was it that had you put that all together for people? And two-part question, why do you think it's so important for traders and investors to have a learning community? I used to run all day seminars and I just found that, you know, if you run them in New York, Chicago, I did them in LA, Dallas, all these major cities, it's cost restrictive. You people have to travel and, you know, pay for flights and hotels and all this other stuff. So we have technology. Why not just put it all online? So it's a lot easier to do it online. And I, and one of the things I like to think I try to do a good job of is, you know, it's always nice to have someone speed things up for you. If you have a personal trainer at the gym, let's say you go to the gym and you're overwhelmed with all these machines. My favorite machine at the gym is a snack machine, by the way. So that's why I struggle at the gym. <laughs> snack machine and cigarette machine are my two favorites at the gym. But if you go to the cig- if you go to the machines at the gym, you're overwhelmed. Wouldn't it be great to have a personal trainer to kind of speed things up and tell you these can work for this and do this and do that? So the analogy with the markets is there's so much content I want to try to speed things up for people, and I think it's important to help people narrow their focus. So first thing is it's important to stay on the right side of the market and just to know basic skills to interpret are we healthy, are we not? Because a lot of people forget the big institutions control the markets, so it's important to track what they're doing when they're consistently buying and the market's healthy. I want to ride that trend, and when they're consistently selling and the market's not healthy, I want to get out of their way. So that's one of the main things is to stay on the right side of the markets. And then for people who like to pick individual stocks, that's really the area that I've just tried to you know, focus on for the past 20 something years is you know, for individual stock picking. That's, what, that's my favorite part of it all is to find those winners and find those great growth companies that have the potential to appreciate in price. And the way you talk about it, Joe, it just sounds like that's what just brings a smile to your face. What is it about that? stock picking that turns you on. Yeah, that whole phrase, it's not work if you enjoy what you're doing. There's never been a Sunday night where I dread going to work the next day. If you're stuck in that, you're going to have to make some changes in your life. And I have so many friends Sunday night, Monday morning, oh, I got to go to work. I've never said that because it, it is not just cliche. It's true. If you're really passionate about something and you really love something, it's not work. I screen the market I look at stocks between 500 to 1,000 stocks every single night or every single school night, and partially because I'm a loser, but partially because I'm just, I joke, but I'm passionate about this. That's what I love to do. I can be watching the ball game. I can do whatever, and I I really am passionate about this because I do love this, and I like finding those next companies. I like you know, trying to find the next McDonald's, the next Nike, the next Microsoft, the next Home Depot, these stocks that have gone up to huge gains. I, I'm always trying to find the next ones because that's what, I don't know what the direct reason is, but that's, I think David Ryan says in his Market Wizards interview, he calls it that treasure hunt. I think that's the best way I could think of it yep, as far totally. as trying to find those next stocks. Absolutely. Halfway Tree has a question. I'm going to unmute you again here, Halfway Tree. Okay. Your question for Joe. Awesome. Thanks uh, to both of you. My question is, how long did it take when you first started to become profitable? And the second part is, how active do you watch screens during the day when you trade? Or, or is it all pre going into the day, you already know what you're going to do? Yeah, those are both great questions. The first one is, I would say doing this 20 something called 25 years, the first half of that was as far as being profitable, I would make a whole bunch of money and then give it all back. Then I'd make a whole bunch of money and give it all back. So it was a brutal cycle of like, you know, insanities repeating the same mistakes over and over. And then that's why I shifted my focus towards evaluating when it's healthy. In other words, how it applies to the current market is I was doing the same things in a difficult market. I was doing the same type of trading in a corrective market where a lot of the stuff I do, especially growth stocks, technical trading, breakouts, they work great when the wind's at your back and we're in a good bull market. But when you're in a bear market, none of that works. And I would just end up forcing trades and giving it all back. So I just made a big adjustment of I'm learning when to step on the gas and when to step on the brakes and ease up a little bit. You know, I've been talking for the past year wrote about it, went on TV, all the stuff saying, okay, the Fed's taking away the 
punch bowl, so to speak, and making it restrictive. So this is where you need to shift. And traders who have been struggling are just probably doing the same thing I did early in my career, which is just doing the same thing they were doing. And you have to be able to shift gears unless you're just a longer term investor in index funds. I totally get that. Just, you know, keep adding to those in your paycheck 10, 20, 30 years. Don't change. You know, that's not investment advice. It's I'm talking more specific stock trading than index stuff. But the indexes are designed to go up every 10, 20, 30 years. So that is something where if you're passive, I get it. As far as screens, I love watching price action. I love watching relative strength. I love paying attention, especially to, you know, when the market's having sell-offs, what stocks are holding up well and so forth. So most of my plan is done coming into the day, but sometimes I will, uh, I don't want to say audible, so to speak, but if something seems interesting, you know, if the Dow drops 500 points and a stock is lighting up green, that'll be interesting to me as far as intraday relative strength. And also I pay attention to unusual option activity. If something sticks out, maybe I'll make a trade or get involved or at least research a position on that. So I'm always watching the screens, but most of my plan is done in advance as far as you know specific trades. Sam, let me know if you have a question. We have a friend in the room from Traders for Cause and Investors Underground. Anybody else have a question for Joe? This is Joe Fami of JoeFami.com. He is a over 25-year veteran of these markets, and he's ready to take questions from you guys if you have some. I just this is part two of two-part interview with Joe for my podcast, The Wall Street Coach, WallStreetCoach.com is an executive coaching firm for traders and executives who want to increase their emotional intelligence. One of the questions, Joe, that I had for you was there are a lot of misconceptions about trading. And I just am curious, what were some of yours when you first started out? Yeah, before I forget, everyone, please give Kim a follow too. She's awesome and she has a a great website and all the information. So please give her a follow. And we've got to become great friends. We met at the Traders for a Cause conference, which I've been very fortunate to speak at the past several years. As far as some misconceptions, I was actually just talking about this with a friend recently, how when I first started, I just assumed every stock you bought just went up. I just assumed like you just buy a stock and it's just supposed to go up. And it sounds so simple now, but I have friends who are telling me now they want to buy certain stocks because they're down off of their highs. And I said, well, their growth is slowing and the technicals are damaged. But they're like, no, no, it just goes up every 20 percent every year. Isn't that what it always does? And I don't laugh at that because I actually thought the same thing. When I first started trading, I bought Gillette, which got bought up by Procter & Gamble. But, you know, I grew up in Boston. It was a Boston-based company. I bought a few shares and I just assumed it just went up every year. I just assumed like you just buy stuff and just things go up all the time. But the more I realized, you know, misconception, it's like I'm not picking on any particular stock, but like the Fang names right now, I think are going to be dead money. Tesla, I heard someone on a space say it's going to see all time highs later this year. Okay, I mean, I also might, you know, grow a full head of hair and hit the lottery, too. I mean, it's anything's possible. (laughs) But my point is, when you study history, like the probabilities of some of these stocks Some will come back, but to just jump back to new highs in a few months is just is a big misconception. And what really helped me is when you study history and go study some of these historical charts, you'll realize that a lot of these stocks, great companies, but you have to separate the difference between a stock and a company. So a lot of these stocks, they're great companies. Apple's not going out of business. Tesla's not going out of business. These are great companies, but their stocks might be dead money for a while because they've already made big gains. So when you study history in the 90s, Cisco, Microsoft, Intel, Dell, all of these EMC, all these big winners, after those big gains, they just kind of went sideways and became dead money for a while because your growth period slows down. So that's another misconception is, The market over time, over every 10, 20, 30 year period, the indexes are designed to go up, but not every individual stock is designed to go up forever and ever and ever. Yeah. We have a question from Street Hawk. I'm going to ask you to ask your question of Joe. Thanks for coming up and listening. Thank you. Joe, can you tell us about selling discipline, knowing when to sell your position, even when the technicals are bullish and something is breaking out, how do you know, well, it's, it's gone high enough or it's going to turn around? Like, let's say FSLR, just to have a concrete example. It's been going up. It has bullish technicals. It looks like it's 
continue to break out. It's a very hot sector. There's a lot of, you know, green energy and all that. But how do you know that this has gone too high and the run is over? What kind of criteria do you have when it comes to closing your position and selling it? That's a great question. And selling, sell discipline is a very common question, both selling on the downside when you're wrong and in your case, selling on the upside about taking profits. It really just depends if you're a trader or investor. You could use key moving averages as long as it's holding key moving averages. And as long as the institutions are supporting them at those key moving averages, you could use that as a guideline. A great thing is in William O'Neill's book, How to Make Money in Stock, I recommend if anyone wants to understand sell rules, I think it's chapter nine or 10. There's a great, great examples of sell rules because it's an awesome question you ask and there's no right or wrong answer. There's no black and white sell here and, and buy here. There's a lot of gray area. One of those variables, are you a trader or you're an investor? Another thing is to use charts, especially when stocks get extended or make huge, huge runs. Like if a stock's made 100, 200 percent move over a year or two, at some point you should take some profits off the table. Another thing is uh, partial selling is allowed too. A lot of people think it's all or nothing. So if you have 100 shares, you don't have to sell the whole 100. You could sell 10, 20, 30, half the position. So there's a lot of different variables. But the reason a lot of people have trouble selling, and this is a very important point, is they have trouble selling because of FOMO, meaning, well, what if I sell and it goes higher, especially if you have a good gain in a stock? My first response to that is you're, you have to accept you're never going to get the highs or the lows. You just have to accept that you just might have to sell a few shares to take some off of the table and you're not going to get the highs or the lows. Once you accept that, it becomes a, your, your mind becomes a lot more clear with your sell decisions. And the other thing is it, it's important to you know, not get too greedy and know your time frame because sometimes, you know, oh, well, FOMO, when I say, oh, a stock – you know, someone I know bought Tesla split adjusted at 200 and it went to the 2000 and they said, well, what if it goes higher? I'm going to miss out. I'm saying to myself, what are you missing out on? You just had if you just had 100, 200, 1000 percent move in a stock, there is no FOMO. You shouldn't have FOMO. That's where greed comes in too much. That's not FOMO. FOMO is when you sell something and you're worried it's going to go back, you know, turn around on you. But when you uh, you know, sell something to the downside. But when you have a nice profit, 100, 200, 300 percent gain in a stock, at some point you can't get that greedy and say, I'm fearing, I fear of missing out because you didn't miss out on anything. You just made a huge gain. So again, there's so many variables and it's such an awesome question. But I would look at William O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. They have a lot of great sell rules in that book. Okay, thank you. Such a great question. Joe, And let me just repeat, please, if you guys have any questions, raise your hand. We have some friends in the room, Brian Lee, Ricky Analog, and Sam. If you guys have questions, let me know. Right now, what do you think is the most important advice you could give to the traders, investors in this space that they perhaps might consider to be unconventional? I don't think people like to hear minimize position size, have some cash, maybe take some time off from trading. I don't think people like to hear that kind of stuff because another misconception, which ties into an earlier question, is just use round numbers. If you have a $100,000 account, you don't have to have all 100000 in the market. Some people are like, well, screw that. I have 200000 I'm on margin. And I'm like, well, it's okay to keep some cash because the best traders I've studied understand where you are in the big picture. And when you're in a corrective environment in a difficult environment, and who knows, we could be coming out of it soon. But if we're not, you have to learn to you know, pull the rein, so to speak, and adapt to the environment where you're in. So a lot of people, when I say they normally, let's say, would buy 100 shares, I said, it's OK if you want to buy, just maybe go 25. And they don't want to hear that. They're like, no, I'm not going to make any money going 25. I'm like, well, in a difficult environment – your goal isn't to make money. Your goal is to protect your money. There's a time to ease on the brakes and, and calm down, and there's a time to step on the gas and get aggressive. So when I've been saying for the past year and telling my educational members, defense, 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 some people are like, well, that doesn't help me. And I said, well, the goal isn't always to make money. The goal is to protect during the difficult times, and people don't want to hear that. So when I say, okay, I get it. We can all be junkies. We all want to trade. We want to stay involved in the markets. So instead of 100 shares, buy 10 or 25 because in a higher volatility environment, instead of getting tossed around, you can calm down a little bit with smaller position size. So that's something just as far as 
you know, if we are going to be in a range or a difficult market for a little bit, it's important to reduce your position size to help give you clarity and so you don't get chopped into pieces trading. One of the things we talked about in the first part of this interview that will all be released in approximately a week was about your listening to music in the day. I want to revisit that conversation from the standpoint of not just music, but creativity in general. Why do you think creativity is so important, Joe? I think great. I, I don't like boring people. I don't, I try not to be boring myself. So at least I try not to, but music, whatever the studies, you probably know better. And, you know, it's seven or eight minutes of listening to music can help change your mood, change your mind. And, you know, as, if it's music you like, it could be classical, it could be whatever rock, whatever you listen to, I don't really care, but music can help alter your mood to the better. And I think that's important, especially for traders. Trading can be lonely, can be very difficult where you have a lot of things racing through your mind during the day. So it's important. Your self-talk is important. It's important. Your mind is clear. It's important. You're not revenge trading. You're not trading from a high state of emotion. And I think music is one way to help with that as far as, you know, don't underestimate, you know, the importance of music during the day. I don't see any other questions in here. What if I, if anybody wants to raise their hand before we bring this to a close, please do. This is a two-part conversation with Joe Fami. His website is joefami.com. My name is Kim Ann Curtin. I'm the host of The Wall Street Coach. We offer coaching for traders on emotional intelligence. This podcast will drop roughly in a week on The Wall Street Coach podcast, you know, iTunes and YouTube and all that good stuff. If there's any questions, guys, raise your hand now or forever. Hold your peace. Words, parting words to the traders that are out there that perhaps are just, they've had enough of this situation with our markets and they're going to have to kind of find a second wind. What's your advice to them, Joe? Oh, I would just say give up, start drinking and just, you know, cry yourself to sleep every <laughs> night. I'm trying to be positive and, you know, I'm here to help. I'm here to provide inspiration. No, in all seriousness, it is a difficult market. It's been difficult for the past year. And as I said, two years, if you've been in growth stocks, you just have to accept it's going to be the cycles of the markets. And a lot of people say, well, how can I prevent this from happening in the future? And, you know, when I talk about studying success, when you read the Market Wizards books by Jack Schwager, he's like, I don't know, four or five of them, and he interviews all the top traders and investors. The one common theme that every single one of them says, their top three rules, cut your losses, cut your losses, cut your losses. That's the one theme all of them say. Just like in real estate, the top three things are location, location, location. In trading, it's cut your losses. So for people who have been beat up, keep your head up and realize that there will be a new uptrend in next bull market. It's the cycles of the markets. But also be honest with yourself. I've been through this and, you know, like I have no problem admitting you make a bunch of money, give it all back and make a bunch, lose a whole bunch back. And, and you finally just have to realize that after the next uptrend and you're doing well, you're going to have to have some sort of sell discipline. Everyone has all different time frames. Some people day trade, some people swing, some people uh, long-term investing. It doesn't matter. I don't care what your time frame is. But to prevent these losses and to prevent if you've been struggling, it's going to involve being honest with yourself and having to learn that, hey, I might be wrong. My thesis might be wrong. The market might not be cooperating. And you have to learn at some point you have to cut losses on positions, especially when they're turning against you and especially if they're turning against you significantly because a lot of growth stocks are 70 to 90 percent off of their eyes. I've never ridden any of them down in the past several years because I learned to cut my losses. Definitely keep your head up and learn from your mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. I continue to make mistakes in the markets. I just make a lot of small mistakes to try to minimize my mistakes. So you're going to continue to make mistakes, but correct the big ones that might have presented some challenges for you over the past couple of years. Joe, I'm just curious because we talked about these other corrections you've navigated when you saw the hints of this correction, did you feel differently facing this correction as it was coming into shore because of those previous journeys you've been on? Well, as I talked about, when the Fed shifted from an accommodative to a restrictive environment, I thought maybe we would drop 10 percent last year in the beginning of the year. And I didn't think it was going to turn into this long of a bear market. And I think I was affected by. So I saw it coming in the sense of 
caution. I didn't know how long or, you know, how much of a grind lower it would be, but I was affected by recency bias. That's why, you know, we were so used to V bottoms, the letter V versus a U where something just snaps back. Hopefully people know the alphabet. So the letter V, you can Google what these letters look like if you don't, but <laughs> the letter V snaps right back. The letter U goes down and, and stays down for a while. So I'm guilty of recency bias where I expected a pullback. I just didn't expect it to last this long. And it's because the Fed has kept a restrictive environment. But eventually we do come out of this. And that's what keeps me you know, optimistic that there'll be some great opportunities. But you just have to, again, adapt, adapt, adapt. You can't use the same game plan in every single market, especially if you trade individual stocks. So you have to, uh, you know, bull markets can be forgiving when you don't stop yourself out. Things bounce back when you buy sloppily with bad entry points. It's forgiving because everything is the winds at your back and everything's going higher. Bear markets can be brutal, can chew you up, spit you out. And if you don't practice discipline and patience and change your game plan a little bit to protect yourself, keep your guard up. You know, Floyd Mayweather is one of the greatest boxers ever because of defense, defense, defense. So he just keeps his guard up so he doesn't get punched in the face. So that's what's very, very important in these difficult markets is to stay defensive. And then when spring comes and when, I don't mean spring literally, I just mean a better market and market conditions improve, then you can step on the gas and get a little bit more aggressive. But it's just really, really important if people have struggled to learn from your, your mistakes, keep a positive mindset, keep a strong mindset, and you know, accept it as part of the learning lessons of these, of these cycles of the markets. The two things that I always see you practicing, Joe, in your talks and in your other, you, you do a lot of Twitter spaces, always have this ability to not take yourself too seriously. You always have this ability to like be able to laugh, you know, at yourself and just let things move through you very quickly. I'm just kind of curious where, where do you get that from? I grew up in the comedy clubs. My brother used to do stand-up comedy. So I i should admit, I've probably seen over 500 comedians in my lifetime. I just try to keep a very, you know, I hate to use all the cliches, life's too short. I mean, like, we're all going to deal with problems, but don't make them worse than they are. Everyone who's been listening to this space, guess what? We've all had bad days. And guess what your success rate of getting through those bad days is? 100%. Because if you didn't get through all your bad days, you wouldn't be listening right now. So don't make things worse than they are. Try to, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Like we're all going to have shit thrown at us every day that's going to affect us in our relationships, in our finances, in our health. But you just got to, you know, just keep moving forward through all this. And I think when you stress and you take things too, too seriously, that affects your mindset. So I try to just have sort of a fun, lighthearted, whatever mentality about things. The less you give a shit, the less stress you're going to have in your life. So the less you care about what other people think, the, the easier your life will be. I know these are all yeah. cliches, but they're all 100 percent true. Well, they're, they're cliches for a reason, Joe. They're cliches for a reason because they're actually repeated often enough. It's just hard to listen to the things we hear. I, I will say this really quick on spaces. I know a yeah. lot of people might want to, you know, we discussed this earlier, might want to ask questions, but they might not say, ah, I don't want to get up there and stuff. One thing I'll encourage, and I've even tweeted this out, mm -hmm. I think public speaking should be mandatory in high school, is yeah. people's number one fear is, is public speaking and number two is death. So people would rather die than get up and, and talk. And one of the greatest emails I got recently was someone said they were inspired by a space I did. They have huge fear of public speaking and they did a space. They said there were like 14 or 18 people on there and they started a space and had a friendly conversation and it really helped overcome that fear. So That's I, fabulous. That's I fabulous. loved it. I, more than someone saying I bought a stock and made money and all that stuff, because you're going to make money, you're yeah. going to lose money, whatever. There's more yeah. important things to life than money. But to well, ha ha know that someone overcame a fear and started their own space and got up and talked in front of people, I just, I loved it. It was great to hear. It's, it's awesome. Well, you're a calm who just had Wild America decide to ask his question. So good job, Wild America. What's your question for today? Hey, Happy New Year. Thanks so much for doing the call, Kim and Joe. Joe, I, I joined a little bit late. I'm not sure if you went into sort of the creation of Zor Capital, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you came to that group and your strategy. 
That's a great question. I don't know, like for compliance reasons, if I can, I don't know what I can really say, not say as far as, you know, I mean, it was just a way for, I ran a small hedge fund before. And when people through social media reached out to me, it was a way to give people visibility through an RIA structure, a registered investment advisor structure. So that way it gives people visibility to their accounts and stuff through, you know, it's comfort in their investments because, I've been lucky through social media, through blogging, through TV, people reach out to me. And my number one thing is, well, I want them to be comfortable with their investments. So this structure gives people that sort of visibility and so forth. So, you know, that's basically it. I enjoy doing it. And like I said, it's just sort of my passion. It's been my passion for a while. So great. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you for asking Thank that you. question. Is there anybody else who wants to ask a question before we close up this Twitter space? If you've been listening, you just heard Joe basically say, have the courage of your conviction to speak your questions forward, not just in this space, but he's also wanting everybody to speak up with their entire life. So I see our friend Ricky's out there, but he's probably, you know, he's one of my favorites because he's probably in his car or out with his kids and enjoying himself. Exactly. Because exactly. I know he's not shy to come up and talk and just say hi and ask questions, but <laughs> Ricky, you re- have a question. You wanna, he reminds you me of the phrase Joe. that he uses all the time. Gratitude is the attitude. It's so important to stay focused yeah. on gratitude we all have amazing things that go on in our lives and, and, and difficult things, but focus on the amazing things. The fact that you got up this morning is a great thing and, and we're all blessed and there's a lot of things to be grateful for. And then when you're grateful, you can even hear it in my voice. You just sound, yeah. you're just happier. Yeah. You're just happier. Absolutely. What's the point of going through trading, going through life? It's, it's funny when you ask me, you know, as far as a good attitude and keeping things light, I, I almost like don't know other ways. Like, do I get angry? Of course, we're all human, but I just don't know. Like, what's the point of trading and going through life, constantly being angry and constantly being frustrated? It's important when you focus on gratitude. It can, it's just, again, goes back to what I was saying, where successful people are always looking to improve. So yeah. if you are struggling and your mindset is not strong, you can stay in that state or you can work on it. And it involves work and it involves being honest with yourself. But I have found that it has helped me tremendously in my trading when I have a better mindset about things. Yeah. Also, I think, too, it just makes whether the challenges or the wins are occurring, it helps you be able to navigate between the two fluidly. And that's, I see that too with Ricky. Every time I talk to Ricky or we co-hosted some Instagram lives, that was a while ago, Ricky. But every time, like he just always had this, again, he never took himself too seriously. So I think I'm discovering a common trait among successful traders here, Joe, is that the one, they follow rule number six, which is, you know, don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. And I just think that is probably underrated. Yeah, no, I I agree. I agree. You got to learn to laugh. You got to learn to not take things so seriously. I mean, going back to that, one of again, another one of my favorite phrases is it's so true. The less you care about what other people think, the easier your life will become. Because what keeps us from doing certain things is, ah, oh, what if they, this person says that? What if my family says that? What are my kids going to think? What are my significant other going to think? What are my friends going to think? What, what are the bullshit people I've never met in my life on social media going to think? <laughs> like when you just when you hear that, you just hear how dumb all of this is when you hear it out loud. Yeah. It's yeah. like who cares? So yeah, I think sure. that keeps people. I think people are passionate. I think people do want to have better lives and do want to have better everything, better health, better relationships, better finances, become better traders, investors, and everything. And it's just so important to overcome those fears that are preventing you from a lot of these things. You know, just, I don't know. I just don't want to be average. I don't want to be, you know, boring. I don't want to be, (laughs) I want to actually have a fun life and enjoy myself while I'm doing it. Well, Joe, you definitely are not boring. I only know you a short time, but so far you are just, you're always uplifting. You're always uplifting other people. You're always encouraging traders, whether they're beginners or sophisticated. You're always trying to give people the confidence and the pat on the back to give themselves more credit or give themselves more time to learn what they have to learn. You're just always building people up. You That's how I first met you. You came up to me after my talk at the Traders for a Cause, and you just said very nice things to me. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe Joe just came up to me and said this. I never met him before in my life. But 
that makes such a difference for people. You made a difference for me that day, and I watched you at that conference do the same for so many. So, no, I appreciate that. I mean, look, your talk was awesome. It was captivating. It was impressive. And a lot of people get up, and you know, some people are better speakers than others. It's just facts. And when you had a great talk that was very interesting, I could have sat back and said, okay, whatever. But it was, you know... I forget who the rock or someone says when life offers you an opportunity or someone comes up, like knock down that door and shake their hand. Go, don't be afraid. Go introduce yourself. You know, okay. so I've been lucky to meet some great, great people, like beyond great people in my life. And if I just hesitated and didn't want to, oh, I'm shy, you know, I wasn't doing it because I'm kissing up. I wasn't doing it for any reason. It was a great talk. And I was like, hey, that was a great talk. Great to meet you. But- and, but I feel like you do that all the time. Like you, no matter. You, oh, I tell so people. I tell spaces. people when, when when they suck too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, but you encourage people. You encourage people, and you try to inspire them with the words that you share to them. I'm not saying you don't give hard truths, but those hard truths even are encouraging because you're not blowing smoke up their skirt. You're trying to, you, you know, if you give people a hard truth, you're doing it for their benefit, for their growth. Not everybody does that, Joe. They don't well, take the time. Or well, what's important to me is that whole thing I talked about, like wanting to improve, is I have friends who go on TV a lot and do a lot of talks and podcasts and public events, speaking engagements, and I always want to try to learn. So I will, if I learn something from somebody that I watch, I'm grateful for that. So I'm going to tell them, hey, you know what you do really, really well? You do this. And I'm going to let them know. And they might be like, oh, my God, I didn't even know I did that. But if that influences me and helps me, it's not being selfish. I'm grateful for that because I can, you know, like they say, if you listen to any talk, if you get one thing out of the talk, it's worth it. If you sit through a half hour Twitter space or a boring bullshit PowerPoint at work and for an hour, whatever it is, if you get one thing out of it, it's worth it. And if I yeah. learn something and pick up, wow, this person told this story well, or they did this in their talk, or, or they went on TV, they did this differently, and that helps me out, I'm going to let them know that was really great what you did. And I don't have any fear to say that because what do I care? If they like it, they don't care. I mean, if they like it or don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, people, I've been very blessed and lucky that people have been encouraging and helpful for me. So I think it's just good karma to pay that back. Yeah. Well, it's just inspiring how much you uplift other traders and investors and want them to succeed and give them, you know, your wisdom and tools and all the painful lessons you've endured. You now share them so people can maybe avoid their own painful lessons. So it's your real contribution to this entire field and industry. And I just am honored to have you today for this conversation. This again, guys, is a two-part podcast with Joe Fami, And this will come out in about a week on the Wall Street Coach podcast. We did part one on Zoom and then came over here to Twitter Spaces. We have one more question from halfway tree. So I'm going to add you now as a speaker. Go ahead. What's your second question for Joe? Yeah, this is a second question, but you know, I've been listening to you guys and Joe took one of my questions back in June. And I just have to echo what I've been saying about just being able to listen to you, Joe. And I, I've been seeking out when, when you do these spaces just to drop in. Really, you remind me of that stoic quote that you have, you have control over your mind, not outside events. You know, realize this and you'll find strength. You just kind of embody that. And I just want to say thank you. You know, I, I know I'm coming back up on stage with the second question, but this made my day listening to this space. So I appreciate you, you both. That's so nice. So you can take the time to say that. I'm so glad you did. So I hope you let that really stick. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I mean, that's, I can't tell you how much that means to me. And I appreciate those kind words. I mean, we're all human and people forget that, that we all have to deal with all the bullshit in our lives. Like I said, it's not just, I know this about markets. Hey, can you give me a stock? Give me a stock. No, right. like, this is, <laughs> we're all humans. We have to deal with relationships. We have to deal with our kids. We have to deal with our finances. We have to deal with our health and family health and all this other stuff. Life is going to constantly throw shit at us all the time. That's it. No matter who it is. I don't care if you're some billionaire fund manager or if you're broke, it doesn't matter. We're all going to have problems, but you have to you know, as they say, how you handle those problems, how you address them, how you tackle them, how you pick yourself up and move on from them is what separates people who are successful and people who aren't. 
you know? So when you say someone like successful people, like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all these people, you don't think they have problems? <laughs> of course they do. They just have a better way of dealing with them and have been able to manage them along the way. So so thank you. That's Those comments are awesome. And I'm, it's, it's great to know that I've been able to help. So I appreciate that. I think it's a beautiful way to bring this to a close. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening, for asking great questions, and for you, Joe, to come into this space for being such a contribution to so many traders and investors. We'll drop this in about a week on the Wall Street Coach podcast. Please follow Joe on Twitter. Most of you probably are. That's why you're likely here. And joefamhe.com is his website, J-O-E-F-A-H-M-Y. He has an amazing course that he sells actually on investor education. Joe, I hope you'll let me have you come back one day to this amazing podcast. Maybe we do another Twitter space. You just rock and you just constantly bring a smile to my face and everybody else. No, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed our conversation. Everyone, please give Kim a follow. She's awesome. She's interviewed some great people and I know we'll continue to. So please give her a follow as well. And it's been my pleasure. I've I've really enjoyed the conversation. So good. All right, guys, look out for the next Twitter space and Joe's podcast dropping. And thank you all for being here. Have a great day and aloha and a hui ho. This has been the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. You can find out more about her and her team online at thewallstreetcoach.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you for listening.